please help me welcome from The Voice, supervising editors Jason Stewart, AJ Diggerson, and graphics producer Daniel Cox. I did a little tee up at the beginning talking about the, the you know, Star Wars and, and The Revenant. Um, we started telling people, our friends and family around Abbott, that we were going to be talking to you guys at The Voice. I, I can't recall a guest that drew so much attention. I was like, oh, you got to find out how they do that show. And a lot of other questions I'm sure I'm not going to be allowed to ask anyway, so we'll just move past those. Right. Um, but reality television is infamous for being just such a huge undertaking in general. And if you watch The Voice, as we all hope you do, and you see the end credits, it is a small army that puts this show together. Why don't we start off by talking about how that army is regimented and uh, how you apply the personnel to uh, getting this show on the air. Right. Well, I, I'd say that, I mean, the first thing that happens is they shoot the blind auditions. And the blind auditions are shot over several days, and then there's a lot of footage. There's over 100 auditions that are shot. And uh, we have 22 editors. Um, fluctuates, but around 22. And basically, we all take what we call pods, and it's sort of like a segment. But it's what I think a lot of people think we do is we, sh we do the home follow package, and then the rest plays live when, when they come out. But what happens is one of us would take a pod, and it's basically from the home follow their whole story all the way from their coming out to audition, the music... Uh, performance section, all the comments all the way through the end and sort of the wrap up, that's like a, a pod. And so we'll all cut a bunch of these until there's a hundred plus of these in the system. And then the producers in the network will look at what all there is and try to find some commonalities between them and construct these two hour episodes based on uh, what they think, you know, sort of fits together the best and has the most variety and excitement for the night. And then uh, uh, the f finishers, we finishers will then take an episode and we'll have a team of two or three other editors and a producing team that'll work with us to take that show all the way to lock and, and, and going out. So in the beginning, it's a broad process of just kind of finding out what we have and then we sort of put it all together uh, in an episode at the end. So AJ, will you literally own Jason talked about yeah. the pods and how they're structured. Is it your responsibility to own that from beginning to end, at least editorially speaking, or are there different editors that would work on a, on a certain pod? Yeah, just in the beginning, uh, it's your own. Um, and you kind of, uh, you probably start with an 18 or a 20 minute cut front to back, and ultimately that's going to be down seven and a half, eight, ten minutes, something like that. Uh, it's kind of always shrinking as it's moving along the process, and when it gets into an episode, uh, that's when we kind of are figuring out, you know, where it fits within that episode, what, what story is following what other story, and what kind of contestants make up that episode. Um, so at that point, it, it is changing hands a lot. It's going from team to team. So uh, Jason might be helming show 101, and I've got 102, and uh, a lot of what our job becomes in that final month uh, before the blind auditions are really done is swapping things around and passing somebody back and forth. And uh, so it is a, it's a very shared uh, atmosphere there. And it, it's amazing because a lot of us have worked together now for 10, 12 years um, on a lot of Mark Burnett shows. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, just, it's a cool job because we, we're all so close and, uh, it, you know what I mean? It's like a... I mean, I think the cool thing too is that when the stuff gets passed around so much, I might start a pod and it ends up in someone else's show and then I don't work on that again. They kind of mold that into what it needs to be in that show, which is maybe different from what it would have been in my show. So, you know, people have in their lives a lot of stories uh, that we might want to tell and we have to choose one or, you know, and so what starts to happen is what worked in the pod doesn't work for the show and you sort of modify it once you get it. But by the time the credits roll in show 101, it's almost guaranteed that all of us have had a hand on that episode in some way or another through the kind of community of editors. But how many editors are working on, I know it's hard to say an individual episode because as you illustrated, it really sort of, it's kind of modular, but how many editors are on staff? Yes, or do you even know? 22. So we, we have about six teams of three generally yeah. when we're in that uh, episode mode. 
everybody's kind of, everybody's probably cut six or seven pods on their own for the first month. Uh, and then the next two months are shaping them into the episodes and we're, we're each on an episode, the, the first six. And when you watch this show, one of the things that strikes you right away is um, the visuals. Daniel, there are a lot of graphic elements to this show. And I think over the years, they've actually changed a little bit. I mean, they, they, they get refreshed. What, where in the process are you brought in in terms of helping to figure out how you want to change the graphical treatment of the show and what ideas have you brought to the table for this, for this show? Um, I brought it in post and basically the EP has kind of mandated a look for everything and they, before in the past seasons they had sort of taken photos and just put them on a background and that was it. And this season they wanted to up the quality and they also, but they also wanted to have an organic practical feel. So we sort of came up with this look that um, was developed not exclusively by me but by kind of other people that um, these Polaroids hanging on a wire or held up by clothespins. And we would uh, move those, you know, do camera moves with those. That would look, it would look like they were on set. They were lit that way. Um, or, you know, we would use backgrounds from home follows for the contestants and use those just to sort of make it look like these, you know, photos, part of the story of these contestants is, is actually integrated into you know, the, the package. Yeah, I mean, the goal is to is to keep from being taken out of the environment that you're in. So if you're going to go to the person's small town where they grew up, you know, we want to kind of keep you there. So we would project things and post onto walls of their hometown. We would put photos in frames in kind of CG to sort of, uh, you know, keep you in that space. And then also the idea behind doing things digitally like that was so that we could modify and edit later on. Maybe a photo needed to get changed or maybe there's something, you know, that didn't clear legal and we needed to change it. So we came up with a system for having graphics that seem to fit the look of the show but also have the, the ability to move back and forth. And so many times there's, there's material coming out of Media Composer and high res that will then track titles into or put photos in or, or whatever. He'll create the stuff. We kick it all back out in a DNX codec that fits uh, our workflow. And then they go back in. And then there's revisions and revisions. So you know we try to be light on our feet in terms of making changes on the fly and last minute. So reality television, I think there's a preconceived notion that it's, it can be a very rigid workflow and, and very heavy on process and managing media and logging media. And the, the, the reverse of that is this notion that you don't have a lot of freedom for creativity or at least bringing new ideas into a show. I don't think that's really the case for The Voice. I think you guys have a little more freedom than that. We do, and it, and it uh, I mean, part of what I love about the show is how, it, how the um, format changes. Uh, so our, our, our deadlines get tighter and there's a little more adrenaline, and now we're into the live shows. Uh, we're cutting short minute and a half packages in one day, basically. We're trying to race through and get a couple of those done in a couple days. And this stuff um, we cut Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this week are airing right now, so uh -huh. it's a pretty tight turnaround. <laughs> yeah, so we start, so the blind auditions, we have a few months to play with, and things get into shape. The battle rounds are a little bit tighter, maybe a month of turnaround, uh, a couple weeks, maybe, or a week for the... <laughs> The knockouts. The and, other thing uh, I think that's cool that you touched on is that is, is the flexibility and the freedom in, in terms of the storytelling is that it's kind of a hallmark of Mark Burnett shows is that he's historically always allowed the editor to take a crack at the stuff. You know, you sort of get the footage, you're, you're given guidelines, and then the producers really give you the flexibility and the freedom to find the story that 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 draws you in. And then they sort of help hone that, you know? And so whenever I'm cutting something for the show, I, I, I think, well, what's memorable about this person? You know, like, what do I find to be really poignant or ex interesting about them or funny or quirky or whatever? And I think that we find that when we hang on to those moments and we sort of build stories around those, they tend to make the cut, you know? Anything that's a little bit more sort of going through the motions, like I, I sing, I came here, I'm here, uh, tends to get reworked because they're looking for that uniqueness. They want the things to stand out. And so many times you're given the footage and you're given the interviews and maybe it's, it's a couple hours of interviews and, and um, a couple hours of footage. 
and you know, you get your coffee and you sit there and you're like, all right, let's see what we can do with this. And, and it's always exciting to have the producers in to sit down and, and have them share in seeing, you know, what you were able to find. We were, at, we were at Universal last week talking about this. Mm. I remember we were having lunch. You were saying, well, I'm going to go back now after lunch. I'm going back to my edit suite and see what the day, what, what's waiting for me today. You literally right. didn't really know what you were faced with. Did you meet with the producer at all prior to that? Or is that you just sit down and start working and then they come in and you kick around ideas? They stay, they stay very in touch. I mean, they all have their own style. But basically, they're there for answering questions and filling in blanks and letting you know what happened on set. I find in reality TV, I think in, in a lot of forms of TV production, what happens is there's a, there can be a disconnect between production and post, and you don't know exactly what they were doing out there. You get the footage and you're, it's like you have blind spots. You, you don't know what they were going for. Our producers are all in the field, then in post, and then in the field and then post. And so it's very informative you know, to have them right there as a resource you know, all the time. Because I've worked on a lot of shows where that's never the case. The producer will be in the field shooting, and then they're off to another job by the time post starts. Yeah. You don't even meet them. You know? That happens. So it's really nice to have that constant input. Um, AJ, I think you, you, you drew this out a little bit about the evolution of the show during a season from you start with the blind auditions, mm -hmm. and you have the battle knockout rounds. We're still in a... In a truly just strictly post no live then to the live you have more freedom or you have more time up front but it sounds like more work to do is that is that a fair assessment then once you get to the lives there's less material to work with but the turnaround is so much faster that is does, does it feel balanced for you as an editor from beginning to end in the season or do you do you ever get to a part where it's like okay i can i can take a breath or <laughs> uh well yeah i know it, it just makes it different and a little more exciting I think as an editor that it does switch up for us too. Uh, the first show I worked on for Mark Burnett was a show called Rockstar. Uh, there was an in excess and a supernova. And that show had the craziest turnaround where we were uh, cutting act one as it was just sent up from the studio while act two was being shot. And we had to have act one in shape before then we got the footage for act two. All of that happened. We had one executive screening, and it, 45 minutes later, the thing was on the air. And uh, it was insane adrenaline. And I've always, I feel like I'm always trying to get that back. <laughs> this show gets close right. near the end, near the live shows. Uh, so I don't know. That personally, uh, I enjoy this period of the show. Daniel, for you, is there an ebb and flow during the season in terms of graphics? Is like in the in the blinds or the knockout rounds, is there, you have more freedom, and then once you get to the lives, they're asking you to constantly turn around things? No, it's true. During the blinds, there's a little bit more time to sort of develop things. Um, just to give you an example, this week, you know, I'm gonna go in Thursday. I won't know what I'm gonna be faced with, but I'll develop a look for that. It'll get approved. Friday, I'll start getting lock shots. Work Saturday, it's Sunday, it's gotta be delivered. So it's a very fast turnaround. We use that term approve, and I know in a network show, there are so many stages to getting approval on things. How does it work on The Voice, if you can talk about it, in terms of, like, you, you make a cut. How many layers do you have to get through before this thing's going to go to air? Well, the, the, the nice thing about our show is, is uh, everyone mostly has been on the show for a long time, and there's a lot of trust, you know, so it's like my show producer is okay f for me to grab our executive producer, Lee Metzger, and pull him aside and say, hey, I want you to see this, um, as opposed to having to go through layers, because we know that Lee's going to tell us what he wants, ultimately. And so, uh, depending on where you are, you know, you might, have, you might have several layers that you'll go through before it even gets to an executive producer, and then from there you'll do their work, and then the, the, the network turnaround starts. But, um, but the nice thing is, is that, you know, we all pretty much have a feel for what Lee and also the network are going to find compelling. And it's always this game of trying to uh, create something that checks those boxes, you know, so you can walk out of a screening and feel like that's, that's what we were going for. Or they, that was unexpected to them, but they still found that exciting and fun and, and, uh, and you know, get, we, we, we get the creative things locked down, and then the finishers and I, we go in and we fine tune and, and, and get the thing to time and whatever and sort of do the final pass. So 
Um, it can take a while. Also, as shows shift around and the order changes, that can, that can take a while. But, you know, in the end, you look at it. I, I always look at a finished show in the online. It's color corrected, and I can see it all. I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that actually worked out all right. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> when you're in the weeds in the middle of it, you know, it's hard to see it. You had mentioned um, having some freedom to create and, you know, finding a moment with certain, I don't want to say characters, or I guess contestants, vocalists, whatever you want to call them, and thinking back about, okay, what is it I want to say about this person? You go back, it's, is it six seasons now? Is that my right? Or seven. Seven, six, yeah. seven. Mm -hmm. Probably feels like eight. Mm -hmm. um, how do you manage those assets? You're having to go back to older, calling back to older shows, older seasons even. How do you, how do you track all this stuff? How do you contain it? Well, what we do is, is we have our editorial projects that are shows, episodes, you know? So, like, at first, all the contestants are put into these, these contestant projects that are alphabetical because we don't know where they're going to go. So you're, you know, you're in the M folder, you know? And then, and then as they become shows, they become episodes, and then uh, we build on top of that. And then we have masters of all the old shows that are, have the final audio stems and uh, the color-corrected picture if you need a flashback somewhere. That's always there. So it, it's, there's several projects that we work out of, you know, but it's, it's pretty clean where you need to go for what. And then uh, we'll, we'll have contestant uh, folders that'll have all their, all their media, uh, the original cut of them, and then their photos and any other assets that go with them. So that's all in one place, alphabetically stored. We always can go back to Matt's folder and find all of his original material. And then moving forward, um, that stuff tracks ahead and gets added to as we push on to the live shows. And of course, there's people fall out, you know, so they get to be a smaller pool. But, um, you know, it, it, it's all... It's all organized in a nice, neat way in the beginning so that there's no guesswork later on. And then everything is in script sync as well. So we have, we have our uh, uh, interviews in script sync, obviously, but also we have our reality in script sync. And it, it makes it easy in the notes process to be working on a cut and you get a note, didn't Adam say something about you know, her range? And I can just go type in range and in the reality, it'll take me to that moment and go and it's, 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 it's a tool that we use a lot, both for building and then for refining down, downstream. Within those, what you call pods, the segments, there, there's a lot of different styles of editing you get to do. I mean, you guys get to do sort of a documentary style editing. Right. You get to do performance editing. Um, is there a, 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 a kind that you like better? Or there, do, you, do you just like the variety of it? Or do you say, oh, I'm really looking forward to doing the performance, or I want to get back to doing the, the docu-style? Does it even matter? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, th I think the variety is what is cool about it. Um, yeah, and we were talking about the other day, we, we both kind of enjoy cutting the comments section, too, which is just mostly tightening up, maybe shuffling things so that it makes a little more sense, or somebody follows somebody. Uh, but it is, there's a bit of uh, a sense of scripted editing in that phase where you're creating a conversation that's got to feel completely organic, even though we've cut 10 minutes out of the 20-minute conversation. Right. One of the things that, that I really like about the show uh, that's, I think, different from other reality shows that some of us have worked on is that there's a sense of, like, staying true to the material. Yeah. You know, like, they really want, if, if, if Blake is going to talk to a contestant about what he thought about their thing, like, all we're really doing is distilling that down. We're not even really allowed to, to alter that to make it sound more harsh or more nice or more anything. We just get to choose the representative thing there because the, the coaches uh, and the artists on the show are people also that we're working with every week, you know, like on an ongoing basis. We want to make sure that they're happy, they feel like they're being represented correctly. A lot of reality shows that we've all worked on, uh, you know, the contestants are, are brought in, they do their thing, they leave, and then it's up for grabs and they've signed their kind of life away in a, in a waiver, you know. Um, because the show is, is this sort of ebb and flow of it's being shot, it's being edited, edited shot, plus the tone of the show is to be a positive thing. Uh, you know, it, it's nice to know that, okay, I don't need to go in and here and create anything that's fabricated. 
I, I just need to just juice, get the most juice out of this moment as I can. And I think that that's, uh, that's unique, you know, in, in this genre. Over seven seasons, I mean, the show has a core, um, I don't want to use the term formula, but I'll call it that, you know, a structure and how it works. But have there been changes to, have there been tentpole moments over these seasons where you've altered, you know, other than swapping out coaches, uh, changed the format of the show or changed your approach to how you do things or even changed the technology underneath, graphics, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, we only added in-house graphics this last season. And that was in an effort to freshen the look of the show up and also make, like Daniel said, things feel more integrated. We tested a lot of things. We worked in those. And then, um, and then you know, we decided to shoot in a, a much more docu style when doing home follows and things like that. Um, and on the live shows, one stylistic change that we made last season was to make the packages be a lot more sort of stream of consciousness where they're not really about like, I'm doing this song, here's how I feel about this song, I hope I am good on this song. You know, it's not sort of like the structure that we're used to. What we started to do now is like a day in the life kind of situation where we're with the kids like uh, at rehearsal in, in the van and, and at the, you know, meeting with Pharrell and doing their thing and, and we see it kind of more from their point of view. So that's been a stylistic change that came both in the production side and in the editorial. And one thing that was nice about that change too was, was we found that we started to have a dialogue with production that was a new thing where, where you could have an idea in post. Oh, he mentions his sister. I would love to meet that sister or like see her. And we'll call production and say, can you guys shoot a, you know, have him call the sister. I would love to get that, you know. And so they'll shoot additional moments um, that they might not have planned to shoot, you know, that sort of help flesh out these stories and everything. And so it's, it's sort of, in a way, it's sort of following its own path. It's not, we're not trying to shake it up because we think it's broken. It's like it's, like it's following the audience and, and, it, and it's, it's taking a natural path to find itself, you know, away from like a, a stage show with, a little bit of reality painted in to more of an experience, you know, that you feel like by the end, you get to the live shows, you turn them on tonight, later tonight, uh, you know, you feel like you know those kids and you, and you have your favorites and all that, so. So you were nice enough to bring uh, with you some screenshots of what your timelines look like for various oh, right. um, stages of post-production. Uh -huh. We're gonna just pop a few up here and um, get you to walk us through what we're looking at, oh, this is a good one. So this is act one of show two from this season. And uh, so you can see, we try to be real organized, right? So we, we label all of our tracks. Uh, we, we, have a, we have a system for where we patch everything so that the mix is nice and smooth because there's not a lot of time to mix the show once it's finished. Yeah, we're cutting with, uh, with 24 tracks and, they're, and that stays consistent through every phase of the show. And they're full. It's always the same, same audio track assignments, whether you're doing a pod or all the way to the live shows. Right. Uh, so that it can... And so the, the top piece here is most likely that's a super tease. It's a little fine-tuned kind of trailer cut. And then it switches into a scene mode here. And then, and then like we were talking about, uh, a, a lot of what goes on is switching your brain from like docu editor uh, right into stage multicam editor where you're working on continuity and you're trying to make sure you have the nicest shots that are nice and clean uh, into a tease maybe, you know, and, and I, it's, it's, it's an interesting challenge because most people are, are, are super tease editors. We have two great super tease editors, and they just are in super tease world, you know. So, like, if you were to throw them a dialogue scene, it would take them a minute to just sort of get their bearings. I'm sure, just like it would for me. So, uh, but but for us, a, a pod encapsulates a lot of different strategies for editing, whether it's the the storytelling, whether it's the stage, the, making it feel as live as we possibly can, whether it's um, you know, emotional moments toward the end that are music driven and all that. So I, I think that, I think the, the thing like AJ said that we, we enjoy about it is that it keeps changing 
throughout your day it's changing. And uh, as soon as one thing can get stale, you're onto a whole new style of editorial. You notice a few EQ effects, some other plugins that are going on there. What kind of, um, is there a standard um, type of uh, set of effects, whether they're visual or audio, that you apply, employ through every show? Or? Well, we use, in, in, in terms of the audio, we don't do a lot with effects. We, we kind of uh, will push the gain where necessary, you know, like just with, uh, you know, a, a gain effect or whatever. But, but sometimes we'll have to EQ to clean things up. I mean, it's a noisy set. There, the lights make noise, you know, like so when someone's just talking like this, I mean, there's noise. And so we'll do a lot of like trying to flatten out the noise. The, the, our goal in, in offline is to sell it to the network. You know, by the time they see a cut, we want them to feel like it could air, you know. So we don't leave in things that are going to be questionable to them. Like one thing we do now, you can see in the filler tracks, is we put color correction on things. Like we shoot on F55 for a lot of reality, and that's got a S-Log 2, I think. And so it's a very flat looking deal. But I want to sell my cut. I don't want the network to go, oh, the cut is flat. I don't like the look of it. I don't, I'm not feeling it. You know? So I go in and I do my own color correction that's temp. Uh, and, and we mix everything in a way that the audio is clear, that you're not missing anything. Um, we really want it, when it goes off on a link to be seen, we really want it to be as polished as it can be made in, in that amount of time. Because we don't want them to be thrown off by technical mishaps. You know. Well, if you're using that to sell the network on your cut, yeah. how much of that so-called temp work, whether it's audio or visuals, end up being kept by the people that do, doing the finished version of that? I think that we, we take out our temp color, you know, and then it's a shot-by-shot -shot color after that just for accuracy. Um, you know, it gets mixed in Hollywood at levels, and I, I, I feel like they probably, you know, choose their own effects that they want to do, and they have cedar and they have better ways to, to notch out uh, noise than we do. Um, but, but our stuff gets it past where we need to. It's all about getting up across the finish line, you know, because we all know it's going to look great. It'll go through symphony. It's going to look great color-wise. It's going to sound great. It's going to levels, full Pro Tools mix, the whole deal. It, it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be 10 to 1M. It's going to be DNX220, we, we know it's going to be great, but you have to be sure that your audience can feel that too in the offline. So, okay. I know we have another screenshot here. I think this time we're getting into um, what I think is some multicam work. So this is from a blind audition. Uh, you know, I, I think this section of the timeline, basically it's transitioning into where someone's been chosen and uh, the wind cue music kicks in and the applause starts to happen and everything like that. So we, we do tend to go in and notch out all the unnecessary mics and try to keep the noise level to a minimum. So a lot of times we'll get a cut and the first thing I do, I think you are the same, yeah. is we'll go through and we'll tear out all the mics that are dead and we look at the waveforms and we find active audio to save, and then we delete everything else, so we got a nice clean thing to work with, and then we start to cut that down, and then we start to work in multicam mode and picture finessing and stuff, so uh, nothing groundbreaking there, but, but yeah, that's another section of the show. Okay, we have another screenshot. So that's an interview um, moment. You know, this is more of a story section, uh, and so it's interview driven. Um, again, there's a temp color put on him that you can see how the footage originally would look and then, and then a little bit of color just to sort of richen it up. Um, it's like a one light look, you know, we only just choose kind of, this is more or less it and we'll spread it across everything because we really don't want to get into the shot by shot correction. Okay, we have another, I think we have just one more of okay. the screenshots. This might be a different section of the pod. Yeah, so there's a performance. So you can see, you know, we have nine cameras on this, on this group, on this, uh, and then you switch over, there's going to be, is it nine more? It's, it, yeah, it's uh, eight seven, more on a line cut. So you eight more on a line. 17 cameras. So the top left would be your line cut that we get, and then it's all the ISOs. And so, you know, 
we as much as possible go into multicam mode and kind of punch our way through it, you know, and find the moments. Uh, and we have an editor that works on the music, on the performance sections, that does a nice job kind of making those feel consistent. Um, and then I do, I tend, when I get the performances, I tend to do a little sweetening. I'll go in, button push, I'll put in some applause, I'll try to sell that, you know, because it's easy to make it feel. It's amazing what you can do with audio, really, because, uh, you know, you've got the clean music tracks of someone performing, and then somebody pushes a button, and you know the crowd's going nuts, but we're not showing that. You're not feeling that. And we could get a note back that says, I don't think he was that good. And it's because there's no reaction to him. So I always make a point with my team that we go in and we do some sweetening. We put in some applause layers, and we try to sell that there's an audience there, which will be done later, too. But it can be night and day. You can do a cut, you know, and people can say, um, you know, I don't think that that performance was very good. And you can go in with audio only and push things around and, you know, get some better reaction shots and things and show the same performance. And people are like, oh, yeah, I like that guy. So... Uh, you know, everything is about selling it to everyone that's going to be watching it. And where in all this would be the, with the graphic element? I mean, what do they hand off to you, Daniel, in terms of, okay, it's, it's your turn now to, to get involved in this? Um, it, it depends on, like, for the docu-style packages, um, I'll get a reference with the photos, and then we'll sort of decide... What background are we going to use? How are we going to treat the photo? <clears throat> um, what scene we want to put these floating Polaroids in? And, um, you know. You guys were also taking video this year and, and video, uh, yeah. making it look as if it was being projected on a set or on a wall or on right. a brick wall, maybe, or something like that. Yeah. We, we take clips that have home video clips from the contestants and we sort of will project it on a room in their house or we'll project it on part of our set, but we'll try to make it look, you know, as real as possible. Um, within, within the voice world. Yeah, and some of that too is, is, is in order to, you, sometimes we'll get a, a home video that's a very small standard def or sub standard def thing. And, you know, we're forced with, do we put a big mortise around it and a big graphic and we just have a little box with a video? Maybe we could project it on a wall smaller in a shot that looks like a real barn or a real home or something like that. So um, part of it was out of necessity with what we're given. And then the other thing is we just never want to be dipping into a full graphic screen again if we can avoid that during the packages. So we try, it was, it was, some of this was inspired by a package we were working on and the camera guy had sort of caught a shot of the person's grandmother in a frame on, the, on a table in the background. Like pull, you know, I'm, I'm on you and then I kind of go over to the, to the frame. And then we use that shot and it was like, it's nice how organic that shot is in the thing. I was like, well, we, we can shoot a table in a frame, and we can add these things in. And we're not trying to uh, cheat anyone, but we're trying to g give you the feeling like this could be their home. Maybe this photo is over on a corner table or that kind of thing. And so it's, it's getting the B-roll you can't possibly get in advance because you don't know what you're ever going to use in the cut. You know? But once we know, we try to create elements that match their world, you know, and so Daniel's in charge of creating so the, those. The core of the show, <clears throat> excuse me, the core of the show really is the, the performance. Yeah. And I think we were talking about this earlier, what you see uh, in the finished show really is, it is a pretty tight process. I mean, could you just sort of walk us through what All the right. audition process is? You know, we see the contestants sort of pacing around yeah. backstage with their families, and then they're on stage, they knock it out of the park, or they, they don't make it, and get your comments, and then they move on. Is, how close is that to you know, the real process? Well, for, I was very surprised when I started working on this show, and, and I, would, I would get a section where the blind auditions are happening, that it's not like they shoot one, and then there's an hour break where everyone's talking about it and dissecting it, or they shoot pickups, you know, of ah, that walkout wasn't good, let's reshoot that, let's get more cutaways. Like, a lot of shows I've done, they, they've done that, and there's nothing wrong with that. You get some more shots. But this is, like, live. Like, if you go to a taping at The Voice, at Universal, it's like, it's like a live show. You, literally, the person will walk out, they'll perform. The comments usually last half an hour as opposed to the five minutes that we're able to show. But they'll, they'll, they'll choose someone, they'll walk off, and then the coaches will chat for a second, and then you hear the 
stage manager going next, you know, and the next person will walk out. And meanwhile, behind the scenes, they're shooting them, nervously pacing, and uh, they release them through the door, and they literally walk on the stage, it happens, and it's a one-shot deal. So it's, 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 it's really interesting how fluid the whole production has. I don't know if it was always that way from the beginning. You were there at the beginning. It's like, it's like I don't know whether it used to be a more stop and start, but they've got it down to a science. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> that stage is enormous. Yeah. I mean, and uh, the crew of this show. It's incredible. So yeah, it is, it's pretty amazing that there are producers who are, who are at different stations scattered all around the, the wings of the, uh, the main stage to yeah. do interviews and to do jitters and be with the family in one of the rooms and Carson's running around getting a little bit with each of the families and then back out on stage. It's just a huge, you know, handoff between backstage and, and, the, and the front of the house. And then, and then all the producers have to be briefed on every contestant's kind of story, you know? So it's like they come off, you want to be able to say, well, would your mom be happy if that was their story? Or, you know, like, whatever it is, they have to be briefed. This is my person, I know their life story, and I'm going to talk to them about that and get some emotion out of it. Uh, and, and then their person goes, boom, someone else is singing. I mean, it's very fluid. You know, the army is really, there, there's 20 something of us, but the army is the couple hundred, you know, that put that show on. I mean, it's really a machine. It's, it's yeah. amazing. So before we wrap things up, I have to ask the most important question. Hmm. That is, have you ever had a chance to sit in one of the chairs? I haven't sat in a chair. Did you sit in a chair? I sat in a chair. Of okay. I took a picture. Of you. You know? what, is, is that your Facebook <laughs> picture? <laughs> that would be so That's cool. That's what you're supposed to do. You've sat in a chair. I, yet. I will. All right. Okay. Well, AJ's got one on you guys. <laughs> um, obviously, you guys have a very demanding schedule, so we can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us today. Please, everybody, help me thank uh, our esteemed guests from The Voice. <laughs> <laughs>